Today on the show, I'm happy to have Nick Fogel. He's the founder of Churnkey. They focus on client retention for SaaS. Nick, how much revenue are you protecting for your clients right now? As of today, we're protecting over a billion dollars in subscription revenues. How many employees do you currently have in the operation? We have tripled in the last year. We've got 15 now. So we're scaling when fast. Did, when did you actually found this one? This was back in 2021. It's funny. We actually started this company the same month that we exited our previous company. So how did that exit go? What was the company there? That was a company we founded way back. First startup that was, had any success that, I, that I'd worked on. My co-founder and I started that in 2016. So it was about five years from, even in 2015, we really started working on the idea. But yeah, about five years until an exit. So through, through exiting that, I know you said you were approached by Spotify. Would that end up being the person you sold to? No, they came to us very early on. Back, Spotify was doing a series of acquisitions. They acquired like Gimlet Media and Anchor App, I think was the other one. And they were just like trying to round up as many acquisitions as they could. They talked to us. We were very small at that time. And it just, it wasn't, it was pretty clear that their corporate dev guy was like, yeah, you guys aren't quite the right size to justify doing a deal. But that, it was an eye-opening experience because... Until that point, we had not considered selling the business. And as we talk more to other brokers, and as you grow any kind of SaaS business, you tend to get these inbounds. We started to realize, hey, there's an opportunity long-term to build toward an acquisition. When you did finally decide to sell, were you approached or did you actually go out and start marketing the business? It's funny because we had been meeting with a broker off and on. And if we rewind, this was like 2019, right before COVID happened. We'd been meeting with a business broker. They said, you got a great business. It's growing fast. There are certainly opportunities for you to get acquired. I had a value multiple in mind for a business like ours. It was five to six X of our top line revenue. There's a lot of discrepancies there though, between buyers, they want SDE, like the seller discretionary earnings instead of top line, if you're not at the right size, but we were working toward this for a number of years where it was like, we're going to build the business. And something that I learned too, through the selling process was like, a great business is one that you don't actually want to sell. So I don't know that we were ever desperate to sell Wave. That was a good point here is I think if we'd been desperate to sell it, we may have shortchanged ourselves and sold it for something. And we actually declined an offer at one point. Uh, it was a life-changing amount of money for me. But we declined that offer because at that time, it just we knew there was a lot more upside that we could have. Uh, the actual, it's funny because COVID was a big tailwind for our business. Everybody was creating podcasts and what our business did was it served creators, video creators, content creators, helped you to create video in an easy online way. So we had a huge tailwind during COVID. We grew a lot. We were planning to go to our broker in early 2021 and start hitting the market to round up potential interest. But we got five letters of intent within about a month, November of that year. We got so much inbound interest. And then we had a bidding war, a little bidding war between our three favorites. And ultimately, we chose a buyer called Calm Capital. The offer was not the highest offer we had in terms of like pure cash, but it was like the perfect mix of culture, finding the right partner to take the business to the next level. They weren't going to just hack it up for parts. And it was a nice life-changing amount of money for my co-founder and me. So now that you've exited one, do you now start your next business, Cherenki, with the exit in mind? It's weird when you sell a company, particularly when you're an entrepreneur and you want to just be working on something, building towards something. It's definitely in your mind because you know what it feels like. You've been down that path before. But when you've been pouring your heart and soul into something for a number of years, it's also this void that's left over once you sell a business. It's, okay, what do I do now? I'm 37. I'm not going to retire if, if Turnkey, if some giant acquirer came in and offered us an insane amount of money we couldn't say no to, it would be a difficult decision. Because I'm looking out the next 10 years, what do I want to be working on? And the other funny thing about Turnkey was like, we built this out of a recognition we found in growing Wave, where we wanted to sell Wave for this 5 to 6x value multiple. The main reason we weren't going to be able to hit that, according to our broker, was our churn rate was so high. So Turnkey, the business we run now, it was born out of that need to see, not only is the business not growing as fast as it could because of our retention problems, but our value multiple would suffer. So that's what we do today with the new business. And it's nice to be able to create a startup and have this idea around it that you felt and experienced yourself. What was your failing success story that led you in entrepreneurship? 
Oh man, we'll start at the beginning. 2008, I graduated looking at big banks, banking job up at Bank of America. I was at a dinner to, for all the new hires. And then 2008, the banking crisis happened. Bottom fell out of the housing market and the hiring freeze. And so I said, okay, I'm going to go to law school. So I doubled down on education and it was not the best decision for me. Number one, I didn't really like the practice of law. I wasn't that interested in it. And the really difficult part about this season of my life was that I had to take on a lot of student debt because I rushed into law school rather than taking a time, taking a while, thinking about it. So I took out about $160,000 to go to a private law school over three years. And at the time, interest rates were like they are now. They're pretty high. So my grad plus student loans were at 7.5% interest on average. So that $160,000 after three or four years of actually just like paying the, I'm just paying the, whatever they're telling me to pay, it grew to $250,000. So I had $250,000 in debt, quarter million dollars in debt. It was amortizing by 50 something dollars a day. So every day, just to keep it from growing, I had to pay $52 in interest. And at that time, even before that, I'd realized that Number one, the practice of law was not as lucrative as I thought it would be. Number two, I didn't en particularly enjoy it. So I was like, how do I get out of this hole that I'm in? Nobody's coming to rescue me. These loans are not going to be forgiven. So I said, oh, I really like creating things. I want to build a company. I had all these ideas for startups. The problem was nobody's, no engineer or software developer is going to work for some guy with just an idea. And so I had to teach myself to code to build out some of these early startup ideas I had. I was actually driving a shuttle over on Kiwa Island. It's like a resort near where I live. And in between shuttle pickups, I'd pull out my laptop. I'd do Code Academy, teach myself to code. And I was just obsessed with this idea of, I got to build this thing. I got to build this startup. I've got to get out of this mess I'm in. And after about six months, it was clear that the startup didn't really have legs at that time. But I got good enough at writing code that I was able to get an internship at a uh, large software company here. and just work my tail off, first one there, last one to leave, and turn that into a full-time job. And I spent two to three years there just grinding through the corporate cubicle setting. And on the side, I was constantly knowing that I've got to find some way where I have full control over my income and my future. So throughout that process, it was continuing to work on entrepreneurial ideas, honing my skills. And then when we found that idea that was like really taking off, I was able to leave that nine to five and pursue it with everything I had. And after that, years later, you've now had an exit. You're now on the next business and it's really starting to move. So yeah. if uh, somebody wanted to get in touch with you about Churnkey, who's the right person to reach out and how do they get in touch? Yeah, you can reach out to me. My email is nick at churnkey.co. That's C-H-U-R-N-K-E-Y.co. Yeah, and we help subscription businesses of all sizes from the household name brands that you've heard of that you probably have a subscription with to small businesses that are just starting out that have churn and retention problems. So we really serve all shapes and sizes, any kind of subscription business, even car washes, brick and mortar subscription businesses. Thank you, Nick, for coming on the show and everybody for listening to another episode of Failing to Success. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki, and we'll see you next time.